Welcome to this edition of CBN News Showcase. I'm Charlene Aaron. They call it the Ferguson effect, a growing animosity against police from the communities they serve. As law enforcement officers endure intense scrutiny, they're also facing a spike in violence. And some say the thin blue line is being stretched to the breaking point. Chuck Holton has the story. Joe Collins is a husband and father of two boys who lives in Blacksburg, Virginia. He's a veteran of both the Marines and the U.S. Army, and he's seen plenty of combat. Our fire team and our vehicle was hit um, 11 times uh, by these. Our company was hit approximately 150 times, and uh, we found probably the same amount of that. When Joe returned from Iraq, he felt like law enforcement was one place where he could continue to serve. Obviously, you have a lot of veterans coming back. They're getting out of the military and they're looking for something with that same type brotherhood. He loved the 14 years he spent as a cop, but he says police work is becoming increasingly dangerous. It's getting worse, it's getting worse. That means it's getting more dangerous for the men in brown and blue in whatever uniform they wear. Police work has always been a tough job and no one says cops are perfect, but violence against law enforcement is rising. So far in 2016, officer deaths by shooting are up 300% from the previous year with a marked increase in ambush-style attacks. In February, policewoman Ashley Gwinden was murdered responding to a domestic disturbance in Virginia. It was her first day on the job. She was the 10th officer to die in the line of duty in February. Police often have to make split-second decisions, and with cell phones and surveillance cameras everywhere, many cops today fear their next call could end up as a viral video, possibly ending their career or even their life. Mike Cowan is a SWAT officer in Mississippi. I do think that there's some, certainly some hesitation, and, and I'm a firm believer hesitation will get you killed. There's certainly a willingness to let things slide maybe a little more um, because it's, it's not worth the paperwork. It's not worth having to try to explain yourself because people don't feel like they have the administration's backing or they're concerned about what the press is going to do with it. Michael Wood is an author and contributor to the website Police One. I think there's a degree of difference in the lack of support that officers are getting today compared to what their grandfathers had had several generations before. It has a chilling effect on these officers when they realize that if they do their job, that they're going to be vilified in the media and they're not going to be supported by their agencies and they're not going to do the job as vigorously as they might have before. When you talk about some of these big nationwide events and all the press that they've gotten, one of the things that seems to get lost on the media is that these guys were criminals and they were resisting law enforcement. I would venture to say that the large percentage of law enforcement as a whole across the nation uh, has that very feeling. I think they're very frustrated. I think um, the trust from their government, the trust from their own chain of command um, they've got to wonder if it's there. With violence rising, tactics and equipment which were developed by the military are now being used to make policing safer in the face of rising violence. It's a move many have criticized, including the President of the United States. You know, we've seen how militarized gear can sometimes give people a feeling like there's an occupying force as opposed to a force that's part of the community that's protecting them and serving them can alienate and intimidate local residents and send the wrong message. Crime has gotten worse. We need the tools, law enforcement needs the tools to be able to handle those situations. Police deaths in the line of duty have declined since the 1970s when they hit their peak by about a third, but that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. Battlefield technologies developed in Iraq and Afghanistan have trickled down to police departments across the country. And that means that an officer who's involved in a shooting has a much better chance today of survival and a much lower chance of ending up on a memorial like this one. While cops are being subjected to increasing restrictions, they're also being asked to carry out a wider range of duties than in the past. We want him to be an enforcer of the law. We want him to be an attorney. We want him to be a marriage counselor. We want him to be a peer counselor. We want him to be a father figure for somebody. We want him to be able to tell directions at the same time that we want him to be able to shoot somebody and keep them from killing your family. Our job is to enforce the law. If you don't like the way the laws are, vote. Vote in somebody different and, and, and get the laws changed and do it the legal way. Let our officers do their job for crying out loud. Start respecting the people that provide you the safety and security in your home at night. Chuck Holton. CBN News.
The security team at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis is on high alert after a gunman walked through the doors of their church. Its state-of-the-art security system helped the team to quickly detain the man. And CBN News takes you behind the scenes to meet the mastermind who is keeping this 4,000-plus congregation safe. Members of Bellevue Baptist Church are counting their blessings after an armed man entered their sanctuary during Easter morning service. About 4,500 people were in the sanctuary for the 11 a.m. service when 31-year-old Marcus Donald arrived. A church hostess noticed a pistol sticking out of his pocket and alerted a church minister who called church security. Bellevue Baptist, one of the largest churches in Memphis with more than 30,000 members, has long been ready for such an event. In 2014, CBN News highlighted Bellevue in a story about church security. The church I went to as a kid only had about 200 people, and we knew everybody that came through those doors. But when you've got a church this size, this is almost like a civic center. And it's hard to imagine the challenges that would go with trying to keep this many people safe and keep an eye on everybody at the same time. Andy Willis heads up the security team, which includes more than 100 paid and volunteer staff. Today, churches that speak the truth, that teach and preach true biblical principles, they draw a lot of attention because there are a lot of uh, components of society today that don't want to hear that, that are absolutely against that. As a church security team, we have to be prepared for those kinds of situations to intervene and to protect the flock. Willis said the church also relies on state-of-the-art cameras. A camera system that constantly monitors and records activities on campus is extremely important. They're not very expensive, and the thing that you get is you get the protection in a liability situation that you won't have if you don't have it. Police said Donald told them, quote, people in society are a threat to him and that he must be vigilant. Clearly, he uh, was disturbed a little bit. Uh, I'm not a doctor, have no idea what the diagnosis for him is. But he certainly had the potential to do a lot of, you know, really bad stuff. Members are thankful that no one was hurt. Everything was all right in there. I didn't, nothing went on in, inside yeah, the okay. sanctuary. Everything was okay. I heard a disruption in the church, didn't hear anything about uh, anyone being armed. It's well, bad. The pastor said we had a disturbance. Meanwhile, Donald, whose mother attends the church, was arrested without incident, and police are continuing their investigation. On Twitter, church leaders posted, nobody was injured. Praise the Lord for his protection. Willis said Christians need to trust God, but be prepared. The biggest thing that makes me cringe whenever I speak to other churches about security is they will say, we don't have security. We're just praying that nothing happens. The day before the incident, members also held a prayer rally for protection over the church. Just like every Saturday, uh, a very large group of people showed up here and prayed over uh, every seat in the sanctuary, uh, prayed over uh, the hallways and the classrooms. And, uh, you, you know, we, we, we prayed for, for souls to be reached. I mean, we prayed for the message of Christ to get out. Um, uh, additionally, I mean, these individuals that come every week faithfully, uh, led by our pastor, Steve Gaines, prayed for safety. Uh, we prayed that uh, no harm would come to this place. Prayers that were heard and answered. Employees at a coffee stand in Washington State are connecting with customers on a whole new level. A few weeks ago, as they were preparing a drink for a young woman, they found out she had just lost her husband. Pierce Dunn and Evan Freeman say when they heard the news, they did what they always do when they come across someone in pain or hurting. They asked to pray with her. The customer in the next car back snapped a photo of the moment that immediately went viral. The guys say it was just another normal day at work, and they had no idea the moment would inspire so many people. Well, it's a question every soul wrestles with at some point. Who is God? Now National Geographic is trying to tackle the age-old question with help of actor Morgan Freeman. Angela Zadopak has this look at the network's new series, Exploring Faith and Religion. 
Is there life after death? Morgan Freeman takes viewers on a journey to uncover questions like who is God and all the different questions in between. I'm Angela Zadapek in New York City for National Geographic's premiere of The Story of God. Traveling over 100,000 miles to seven different countries and 40 cities, Freeman takes viewers to the world's most historic religious sites. This is going to be quite the adventure. I think we started with the three Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and that was mm -hmm. that was kind of what we anchored it around, and then we decided what was going to work within the constructs of only six hours. Each individual episode addresses some of mankind's most asked questions, showcasing how different religions answer them. Is there an apocalypse? Will there be an apocalypse? What is the apocalypse? And it's different. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. The apocalypse in this religion is different from the apocalypse over here. It makes sense casting Freeman as the face of the series, since he's perhaps Hollywood's most popular voice of God from the hit films Bruce Almighty and Evan Almighty. What was your religious background like growing up? Did you grow up in church or? I didn't grow up in church, uh, but I, I, at an early age, I, I must have gone to church four or five times uh, as a kid. Um, so I always, personally, I was always kind of intimidated by ritual. My grandmother was very into, not religion, but God. Right, a relationship. A relationship mm -hmm. with, yeah, mm -hmm. with uh, the Almighty. In exploring these questions, the Freeman met with different religious Humanity. leaders, academics, and archaeologists from around the world, including Houston megachurch pastor Joel Osteen. Who is God? I believe God is our Father, the Creator, somebody that gives us purpose and destiny. Freeman immersed himself for 40 days and 40 nights in various rituals and religious experiences, visiting sites from the pyramids to Jerusalem. The series airs globally in 171 countries in 45 different languages. From New York City, I'm Angela Zadapek with CBN News. God's Not Dead surprised Hollywood with a box office take of more than $60 million. That success opened the door for a sequel, which opened in theaters Friday. CBN News was the only television news crew allowed on the set during filming. Ephraim Graham takes us behind the scenes of God's Not Dead 2. Do you think you're smarter than me, Wheaton? Do you think there's any argument you can make that I won't have an answer for? God's Not Dead's box smarter. office millions made it the highest grossing independent film in 2014. It also sparked a social media movement with a modest movie making budget of just $2 million. It's not us. We take no credit whatsoever. All praise to God. Carrie Solomon and Chuck Konzelman wrote the story that pitted a student against his professor. What I want is for them to make their own choice. That's what God wants. In a passionate debate about God's existence, the longtime writing partners are taking the concept further with God's Not Dead 2. We pray on everything that we do, and the Lord inspires. He comes forward, and uh, that is really the creative process. The first movie, I think, kind of brought people to the point where they thought, you know what, someone should do something. I think the second movie points a little bit more to, I need to do something in my own life. God's Not Dead was filmed on the campus of LSU in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Much of the production for God's Not Dead 2 unfolds here in Little Rock, Arkansas, inside the state Supreme Court. Where the fictional script often feels like a page ripped from real life headlines. Mr. Kane will insist loudly and often that faith isn't on trial here. But that is exactly what is on trial. Here, a public school teacher finds herself on trial for answering a student's question. Yes. Isn't that sort of like what Jesus meant when he said that we should love our enemies? Yes. Uh, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew records Jesus as saying, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Melissa Joan Hart plays the teacher, Grace. CBN News was the only team invited to the set to watch her film scenes. We chatted with Melissa in between takes. This was a calling for me to do this. I felt like this was a mission for me to go on and to, you know, stand up for my beliefs and, and, and be a little bit um, 
louder about my faith. Like her character, Grace, Melissa is a Christian. I was raised a Catholic girl and married a Baptist, so I became a Presbyterian. But, you know, all the while searching, and in the last few years, actually, I found a beautiful Bible study where I felt a lot of fellowship with the women and, and felt very loved and nurtured there, and, and, um, and it's really helped my walk. You okay, Grace? Yeah, I just can't stop thinking about Brooke. You know, she's searching. She's hurting. Yeah, that's the thing about atheism. It doesn't take away the pain, it just takes away the hope. This isn't your typical sequel. Melissa leads an impressive cast of new faces that include Pat Boone as her grandfather. You need to stop this immediately. Robin Givens as the school principal. I think someone's faith being put on trial in many respects is something that happens sort of in a strange way all the time in this world. She didn't start her class with a blessing. She didn't lead her students in prayer, no. And Jesse Metcalf plays oh, her did. attorney. He's not a religious man, he's not a Christian, but he sort of comes to respect uh, Grace's religious integrity. On a personal note, Metcalf recently talked about his faith, admitting he began a personal relationship with God five years ago when he became sober through Alcoholics Anonymous. The God's Not Dead tune and the Newsboys are among the few familiar returnees in the sequel. Just a little spark in the dark can light up the whole scene. And uh, God's Not Dead was that little, that little train that could. The storylines in both films are personal to the members of the popular Christian rock band. Some people will look at that and say, oh yeah, you're just being too sensitive about your, you know, what you believe in, or you're just being, but it really does exist. And I think that's, there are millions and millions of people that resonate with that, that go through that every day. Mm -hmm. And I think we've gone through it yeah. to a certain extent, even being in Christian music, there's places that won't invite us to play on their <laughs> late night TV shows or mm. other type of things. You know, you could have a, we can have a top four record on Billboard, but uh, if you're talking about that Jesus person, uh, we might not want you to come visit us. Mr. Inland, you are on a board and I charge you with contempt. I accept the charge because I have nothing but contempt for these proceedings. If we're going to insist that a Christian's right to believe is subordinate to all other rights, then it's not a right. God's so Not Dead is no longer dead. just a film. It's a pure flicks that. franchise. God's Not Dead 1 dealt with the existence of God. Is God real? Is he not? God's Not Dead 2 deals with um, who was he? And if he was Jesus, was he man, myth, or Messiah? Ultimately, my hope is to develop an army of people that can talk about their faith intelligently and, and really take that to the world. And the conversation continues. Michael Scott and his Pure Flix team are already at work on God's Not Dead 3. So now the government can determine what we can and can't preach at our churches. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Little Rock, Arkansas. And now we want to, uh, there's a lot going on in the world today, terrorist attacks, deadly diseases, and the assault against religious liberty. But none of these things are bigger than our God. He is alive and he's still on the throne. So let's not focus on all of the personal problems that are going on in the world. Instead, let's look to God's word. Ephesians 6 tells us to put on the whole armor of God so we can stand against the devil's schemes. And Psalm 60 verses 11 and 12 says, give us aid against the enemy for human help is worthless. With God, we will gain the victory and he will trample down our enemies. And that's good news from our great God. And now we want to go into a time of prayer. So join me as we pray for the men and the women who are on the front lines protecting our country. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus, asking for divine protection over this nation. Your word tells us in Psalm 91 that you will give your angels charge over us. We lift up police officers and those serving in the military, the ones that put their lives on the line every day to protect us. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to watch over them, give their families comfort and peace as they walk out the door each day. We ask that you give them wisdom on the job, Lord God. And for those that are believers, we ask that they will continue to be a light on their jobs, Lord God. Your word tells us that we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. 
And when violence breaks out, help the ones that call upon you, Lord, to be lights for you. We ask for your continued peace and protection. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, that is going to be it for this edition of the CBN News so Showcase. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And stay up to date with CBN News through Facebook and Twitter. We hope you'll join us next time. Have a wonderful day and God bless.